cross. But, but what I lack, again, and it's a conspicuous lack, it's, it's a fundamental lack, is a limitation clause. There are endless provisions that allow the legislator to define what the rights are, but there is no check on what the legislator can do. Germans call that Schranken, Schranken, which is a term I struggled with as a student. I hated it, but it's very logical. Schranke is like, you know, the, the, the railway crossing when the bars go down, right? So allowing the legislator to regulate by law is the first one that goes down, the Schranke. And then comes Schranken, Schranke, the second one that comes down, which limits what the legislator can do. So proportionality, right, as an example, a limitation clause that tells us how far can the legislator go? Where, what does he have to do to balance his legislation and his, let's say, you know, legitimate interests, the interests of the state with the prescriptions of the Constitution, with the values of the Constitution? You need to balance that. A legislator cannot do everything. And give me 30 seconds. <coughs> There is big discussion, I understand, about the protest law, the draft process law, right? Protesting, assembly. Well, uh, in Germany, you have Article 8, which allows citizens to assemble freely, peacefully, uh, without prior notification. And then there's a second part of that clause, which uh, tells us, uh, you know, assemblies under free air can be regulated by or on the basis of law. So the, the first provision is different from the Egyptian one. The second one brings the German solution closer to the Egyptian one because what did the legislator do? Came out with a wonderful protest law and said, you know, you have to register, notify within 48 hours if it's an assembly under free air. Constitutional court said, you know, no, 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 no. First of all, spontaneous, spontaneous demonstrations people realize something is going on and here and now there is a need to express their views cannot be suppressed by a law why because the value of the constitution is freedom of assembly and we need to interpret the law and we need to perhaps modify and limit the ability of the legislator to require a notification prior to an event, 48 hours, we need to limit that in the light of the constitutional value, which is freedom of expression dash freedom of assembly. So looking at that law, we can do that later on. There are 10 points, all pertinent to Egypt, where the German constitutional court told the German legislator, this is not the way you can do it, because the constitutional value is too important and you need to look at your legislation and your limitation of the constitution in the light of these values you cannot do this and that is the law in germany today which is very different from what the legislator anticipated i would have had another two hours to go <laughs> i only had two minutes and he's pulled it away again the evidence so i'll stop here but but i would love uh, a discussion and my flight is on Tuesday, Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., so there's plenty of time. Uh, thank you very much. So just as we did for the previous speaker, I would open the floor now for questions. Should I just present and then maybe? Oh. Should I present because we Why don't we have? No. Well, if, unless there are questions right away. Okay, so then... Instant, uh, instantaneous, I talked about instant, right, the demonstrations, if there are instant questions, the if there are instant if questions, the uh, the interpretation. <laughs> if there are instant questions, we'll, we'll take them right away, but otherwise, maybe, because then we have more time afterwards, we Actually, can take them all. there is one already there, and a second there, so. Um, so you said you uh, reviewed the uh, uh, 1971, uh, 2012, and the current constitution, and uh, he spoke Speak up a bit. He spoke extensively yes. about the um, sort of this uh, separation between uh, the law and the constitution, or all of these um, exceptions, the state and the military, etc., are carving out for themselves in different shades and forms. And I'm wondering whether, from the 2012 constitution, you've seen any sort of trend towards um, bringing the constitution towards uh, some form of supremacy, i.e. Um, you know, even, even if there are still a bunch of exceptions, 
and it, the Constitution is still um, seen as sort of a separate form of legal thinking to uh, the law. Um, I mean, I wonder if the Constitution has has shown any progression through its various drafts um, towards um, giving a sense of supremacy to the actual uh, constitution. I, I, I see much too little of it in the light of the fact that international best practice is so overwhelming <coughs> at this point. Now, mind you, may, maybe I'm being too... too um, yeah, there are shades of it. There are shades of it. Now, uh, I lived and worked in the United Kingdom long enough. Mm. You know, seven years at U University College London, you know, uh, let you take a, at least one thing with you. Parliamentary sovereignty is important too, right? Mm. And there's that concept. Of course, n not every system. Uh, and, and look at Canada and the Charter of Rights and the ability of the legislator to intervene. Mm and to suspend for five years indefinitely, just going back to the provision again and again and again. Look at the Netherlands with very little you know, judicial review, which begs the question, what about you know, the supremacy of the constitution? So there are many systems out there that struggle. And the magic, I will say, the magic of South Africa was that with the flip of a switch, you have a system that goes from supremacy of parliament to the supremacy of the constitution. Oh. And if you look at that carefully, if, if you look at see, if, if you look at court judgments immediately after that switch, in the first, say, one and a half years, 18 months, you will see that many judges on the lower tiers of the system, not talking about the constitutional court, but on the lower tiers of the system were struggling with this because they were, you know, doing their best, and no bad intentions, but their training, their experience, their frame of mind was the legislator has spoken. Mm. Now, if the legislator speaks, what am I to do? I will apply the law, right? That's the law. And it took the constitutional court to tell them, no, mm. we have a new paradigm. We have a supreme constitution. You must interpret the law in the light of that supreme value. There has been a change. It's not darkness anymore. It's light, mm. right? And there's no shade of gray in between the two. And there is no compromise between a supreme constitution, as I see it, and, and uh, uh, you know, parliamentary sovereignty, as we see it here. Now, you talk to the 2012 constitution, just one word here. I know there's a lot of criticism, and I know why this document is being criticized. I will say one thing that you know, kind of returns, reverts back to the very beginning of my talk. In structural terms, you know, I, I like that document quite a lot. It, it, it seems, you know, I'm not talking about the content, I'm just talking about structure. Lawyers are, you know, technical people, right? It's, we don't use our tools on the road or we're not doctors, you know, with a scalpel. We use words and we use structure. That's the way the law works. And it's more convincing if it is structured. The 2012 con Constitution does not fare badly by comparison to this draft. This is going back to 1971. Even, I mean, I think my colleague spoke to it, the, the structure of the, the, the human rights, right? Very convoluted, very strange. And, and this is where I wonder, and I'll close here, and we'll, we'll take maybe another question. Look, if, if, you, can, if you can do something state of the art, and, and you know, the world has developed since 1971, why do you go back to that? Why, why I mean, you know, a, a BMW or an Audi, excuse my choice of cars, it, it, Built in 1971 is a very attractive car, and many like it, right? But today, BMW and Audi do not build cars the way they did in 1971. Things have evolved. So why go back to 1971? Why? Why? There's no reason for that. So uh, I, I, I think it's a clear-cut car. Now, is it oversight? Now comes perhaps a more interesting angle to this. There are provisions, if, if a constitution draft, if a committee of 50 tells me, this is our draft, and I look at it, and I see, ah, international treaties cannot be ratified if they violate the constitution, right? If, if, if they come to that conclusion, I will take away from that, they've understood the concept. They've understood that the constitution is the highest law of the land. They've understood it. Right? Because they apply that principle to international treaties. They know what they're doing. Then I ask myself the more pertinent question, why the gap when it comes to Egyptian law? Why is the constitution not supreme when it comes to Egyptian law? I have one question there and the second front. Uh, 
uh, thank you much, sir. Such a wonderful presentation. Um, I would um, be grateful if you can comment on legitimacy issue, because I, um, I very much agree with you. The Constitution is a super, uh, supranational document, and somebody who looks at things from a gender perspective, I kind of like that point. But um, I think what hasn't been addressed properly, just generally, is the role of the Constitutional Commission. And uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there's different ways to assemble the Constitutional Commission, meaning individuals who are going to write this supranational document. So what worries me or what's interesting is that we have this constitutional commission that has been elected by whom, appointed by whom, and does it really represent the public? While the idea is that the law itself eventually, hopefully through some kind of legitimate um, electoral process, would represent the public. So could you just elaborate a little bit on that concept, on um, how can a supranational document that's not necessarily democratically written by those who participate in it can serve to represent everybody else? Does it make any sense? As a, again, for me, it's quite interesting because as a, somebody who works with a gender perspective, you can see what I'm implying here. Mm -hmm. So that would be, uh, thank you. I mean, you're, you're basically addressing the question, how do you design? What's the process? How, how, do, you, how do you do this in, in a society that is very fractured and where majorities can, can shift the balance quite considerably once you do have elections and where you have inevitably, right, the need for compromise. You do need to compromise and you need to have everyone on board. You can, you can contain uh, an idea for quite some time. You can say, you know, we do not want this. But if a substantial, you know, minority, the majority does not need protection. The majority will use the mechanism, ideally, to achieve its aims. And a, a, a document like a constitution will perhaps, bearing in mind that it's not done with the amendment, it can, uh, with the enactment it can be amended, will perhaps gain legitimacy because majorities will start working with the document and will fill it with life and maybe even amend it. But it, it can only lead to so much legitimacy because human rights, for instance, are the rights of the minority. The minority need these rights, not the majority. The majority can protect itself. So the question is how inclusive must a constitution drafting process be? And that very much depends on that very much depends on, you know, how fractured a society is. I'm very wary of constitutional change that works like we'll have a general election, then we'll have a constitutional assembly that will draft the constitution. Because inevitably that is a formula for, for success in homogeneous societies where it's, you know, think of Germany post-World War II, right? Everyone wanted to move on, people had different ideas, Bavaria, you know, wasn't happy with the final thing, but, but said, okay, we'll abstain, go and do it, we'll see. Uh, and that has remained basically its position to the present day. But there was no grave tension in society. Then comes 1990, which is much more difficult, but there was no real constitutional amendment. The East joined the West, so you join something, and if you join the club, well, you better abide by the rules that are set. You're joining it. It's your free choice. There you go. But, but that's not the situation in Egypt. So in terms of inclusiveness, I worry about the time frame. It's much too short. Uh, I worry about the process of appointing uh, a C50 committee, uh, which, if you look carefully, I understand, is not representative of, of, of society as a whole. Um, appointing experts, uh, that again, you know, must be scrutinized very carefully because their influence is quite substantial as far as the drafting exercise itself is concerned, and I think my colleague will speak to that. Um, so, so I worry, worry about all of these things. But it's the South African transition was, I think, in no way easier. I mean, it was it was magic that it worked the way it did. It was magic, and if you if you award the Peace Nobel Prize to someone, well, Mandela and de Klerk both you know, earned it very well because it was that magical moment. But the way you, you can really say in South Africa, the two positions were slowly, slowly, gradually, by the process, melded, and every side was protected. Every side had, and the, the white minority could let go, and the, the people of color could say, okay, we'll compromise because we can see something is happening, and, and it kind of went together. And now we will have to see uh, what comes of it. 
But that was a very inclusive process. You will always lose someone. And you speak to inclusive. I'm not sure that elections on first past the post system, single member constituencies with you know simple majorities, will lead to a result in the future that will kind of bring more legitimacy to this document or to, to society as a whole. I, I do not think so. Uh, I, I worry about that. But I'll leave it at that. I have two, two comments and, and, and the question. The, the comment is about the interpretation of, of law, and in fact, of even constitutional provisions. In the, in the Brazilian constitution, for instance, it is in the light of respect of human rights. And I think this is in itself a very good, a very good provision that could in, be included in the Egyptian constitution, which of course is not included. My second comment is with regard to ratifying international treaties if they are in conformity with the Constitution, which is fine. However, however, this could be a way of shielding society yeah. from evolution. In fact, this could be a gimmick yeah. to keep society from interacting with universal principles of international law. Yes. And, and I think this is a very, very, it could be a very hypocritical provision, yes. which leads me to my question. In fact, it's not only goes back to the Constitution of 1971, it goes all the way back to 56. There is, since 1956, there is a chapter one, on foundations of society. of society. What are the examples you have of constitutions talking about society? Well, I, first of all, a, a comment to your to your you know remark on on on, on treaties and uh, uh, that being a gimmick. Uh, I agree. How, how could I disagree? Uh, I found the, the, this provision interesting simply because it's such a contrast to what this draft is doing with respect to the exercise of Egyptian authority, whether it's legislative, executive, or judicial. So, uh, you know, I, I agree entirely that this is a tradition that goes back to the 1956 constitution, you say, uh, strengthens my, my perception that this is not a paradigm shift. We're staying very, very well within these confines. Now, I, I spoke to some, some, some colleagues these past few days in between events, and some were, were uh, disheartened. Uh, I say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not disheartened. This is not the end of the process. This is the beginning of the process. This is just the beginning. This is round one. And we have 15 more rounds to go. This is round one. And when it's done and dusted, and when it's enacted with all its flaws or its positive things, and it's all there, that was then round one. And this process will continue. It will not end. There have been many constitutions in the past. There will be more in the future. And the genie, as I said, is out of the bottle. The idea or, or certain ideas are, are in the minds and in the hearts of the Egyptian people, at least a lot of them. And that will germinate. So I'm, I'm not discouraged. This is, this is just, just the beginning. But um, you're right in saying this document is not transformative. It is not. Foundations of society. Foundations of society. Well, look, um, you will have constitutions that set out basic principles. Even South Africa sets out some foundational principles in, in, in the first part of the constitution, which... State, rather than society. Yes. Um, but... Still, I mean, there is that fundamental idea that society is based and stayed with it on, on some core. I mean, take the German constitution. It starts with Article 1, right? Human dignity is inviolable, and the state must respect and protect it. 